Welcome, welcome. Press Tour 2014, sci-fi friends, family, press, who are also our friends, I think. My name is Aaron Sagers. I'm the editor at large at Blaster.com. I'm very excited to be up here today. And I hope you guys are excited to be here and you're gonna reflect that using all of your awesome hashtags, sci-fi, PT, uh, and Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr. Just uh, rock the social media. And uh, I'm happy to introduce these two excellent gentlemen uh, sitting next to me. Uh, right next to me is the president of Sci-Fi and also the king of the bowling lanes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that. My top assistant won't. Mr. J. Al, please show your round of applause. I appreciate it. And right next to him is Mr. Bill McGoldrick, who is celebrating sort of your one year anniversary as EVP of original content at Sci-Fi. Bill, thanks for joining us today. Uh, well, Dave, before I begin, I, I, I have to cover something that's, I think, near and dear to all of our hearts. What can you tell me about Sharknado? Let's wow. <laughs> get right to it. Straight up. Oh, well, I have uh, bad news, but I also have good news. The bad news is, unfortunately, Iron Zero has a conflict, so we, we can't do today's Sharknado panel. However, the good news is we are going to give you an exclusive. Uh, you're going to get this first. It has kind of leaked, but we're going to give you the full detail around the locations of Sharknado 3. And next year, Sharknado 3 will be storming the East Coast. It will make landfall and attack America's favorite institution, Washington, D.C. And, and finally, Washington getting what's coming to it. And then it will swallow the entire eastern seaboard, head down the coast, and end up miraculously in Orlando, Florida, where we take out some of Orlando. And we're calling it um, Sharknado Takes on the Feast Coast. <laughs> so, so there's your first exclusive for the day. Uh, well, well, thank you for indulging me on that. Uh, how has sci fi really excelled in owning the, the sci fi genre in, in 2015? And how will that, or in 2014, and how will that commitment extend to 2015? Well, I think this has been um, this has been a fantastic year for us. And you know, I look back to when I first joined Sci-Fi, which was 12 years ago, actually this month, October, 12 years ago. And I joined Sci-Fi specifically because we had probably the biggest project in cable, Steven Spielberg's Taken, which was a 20-hour, $40 million massive event. Uh, and that's part of why I, I joined Sci-Fi, and that's why I stayed at Sci-Fi. And I think this year and next year, especially with Bill at the helm, is absolutely going to be sci-fi at its finest because we're going back to those big, bold, ambitious scripted series that we've owned in the past. So the Battlestar Galacticas, the mini-series events, um, you know, the plethora of announcements that you know you've all been excited about as we have over the last six to twelve months, thanks to Bill and his team, has been incredible. You know, we've absolutely gone on record as saying we want to be the experts in this genre. It's a very competitive genre out there. Everyone and his dog is developing <laughs> and launching sci-fi fantasy shows. We have to be seen to be the best at, in terms of understanding the genre and our audience. And I think we're doing that. Um, Bill has been with us a year. I think Bill is absolutely the best hire that we could possibly have made to get us there. Bill has a fantastic track record, not just on USA, but. Uh, Spike as well, but he is, and this is why we will win and why we will succeed, he is the ultimate fanboy, as, as you get to know him. It's not in this room, I'm not. He is, <laughs> he is the ultimate fanboy, but he has fantastic taste, and he sets the bar very high, and he also has great relationships. So some of the announcements that you've read over the last six months, and you will continue to read, is because Bill absolutely has great relationships with Hollywood, will attract some of the biggest and the best names out there, and I think that will be key to our success. So I'm more excited this year than I ever have been about the potential for where we're going. Mm -hmm. And building on that, Bill, could you tell us a little bit about your important goals within this first year? 
Well, I, I think they've covered a lot of it. We are trying to win back the genre in a way. You know, there's a, there's a lot of shows that, I'm going to be honest with you, that we envy around the dial, and we want to bring that level of writing, that level of kind of modern television to the genre form, as so many books and movies have. Um, and so, so my goal over the next couple years is to have not just one, but many scripted and non-scripted shows that really speak to this audience and speak to you know, the audiences you guys cover on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think we're, we're on our way. Okay. And I do look forward to nerding out with you a little bit later and exploring this, this, this fanboy cred. Uh, but actually, speaking of fans, what is something that each of you would like to say to the, to the fans out there today, if you could say one thing? Bill, why don't, why don't you start? I was hoping Dave would take that. <laughs> I mean, there, there's so much to say, say, say to the fans. I mean, having been here all, almost a year, it's not quite the one year anniversary, I've been really astounded by the level of passion, the level of commitment, the level of specific care that our fans have for each individual show. Even within each individual show, there's subsets of passion and arguments on your, you know, I follow a lot of your feeds and a lot of the comment sections on your feeds and I love trolling through that stuff and, uh, you know, I would tell them I think that there have been some misconceptions about this channel in the past, that we, that we somehow don't care as much as they do, that we cancel shows too early and a year in, I gotta say, it's been really great for me to see that that's just not true and really never has been true. It's a, it's a passionate group of 170 or so people and in every department, these people love this genre and love this show. From, from finance to HR to anywhere, there's a, there's a commitment at this channel that I don't think people fully appreciate it. I think you're going to see shows that reflect that commitment. We have a lot of corporate support now, uh, corporate financing for this channel, for this genre. So really, uh, the handcuffs are off, Dave and I and, and our teams. And, and we're going to be putting a lot of stuff out there and a lot of stuff that we care about. And I think the fans of this stuff are going to care about. Absolutely. I mean, I think I would endorse that. I mean, we, uh, we have a new owner, Comcast, which I think has very deep pockets. They care about investing in great content. Ultimately, that's what we are um, tasked with providing great content. And I think from the fan perspective, we absolutely want to be the home of smart, provocative sci fi entertainment. That's who we are. That's all who we've always been, and you will see from us going forward a massive commitment to that in terms of our programming. And, and to Bill's point, you know, starting last year with Defiance, then, then Helix, then Dominion, uh, Ascension is coming, we've got 12 Monkeys, Killjoys, and then next year, two of our biggest and most ambitious projects, The Expanse, which gets us back into, you know, big, epic space opera, and then the ultimate mini-series event, which is Childhood End, which is the Arthur C. Clarke classic. So you can see, just in those titles alone, how committed and passionate we are to really owning the genre space in a way that we never have been able to in the past. And we will continue to do that. It's great content, and that's what our audience ultimately is going to seek from us, expect from us. And we don't cancel shows. We picked up Dominion to season two. We picked up Defiance to season three. We picked up Helix to season two. We're committed to these shows. And I think what we have uh, that is so perfect for this room and our audience is if you, go, if you go create great content that has that deep immersive mythology that is serialized, that takes you deeper, that has multi-screen uh, ways for you to interact with that content, that you're creating long-term storytelling that is so perfect for our audience and so perfect for the time that we live in that, that it wasn't in the past. When we had Battlestar Galactica, it was difficult for people to commit to serialized shows. Now they absolutely want what we can provide the best, which is deep storytelling, great mythology, great backstories, big, epic, bold characters, and it's exciting. Okay. Let's go ahead and open it up to any questions uh, you guys might have. I don't want to actually like you to expand a little bit on what what do you think the, what do you think is driving this new push for scripted program programming, especially in the sci-fi and fantasy realm, because every network seems to be like kind of like doing overkill on it a little bit. And is there a threshold which like sci-fi channel makes sense, but for NBC and ABC, is there a threshold 
where it's going to be too much. Yeah, sure. Um, it, you know, it is, it, it is uh, fascinating how many people are in the genre now. I don't, I don't necessarily believe there's a threshold. I've been talking a, a lot about this. You know, I think what's happening reminds me very much of what happened when shows like The Shield and The Sopranos hit 10 years ago. It was a provocative sort of storytelling that then launched lots of other shows, shows like that. So Matt Weiner, who was on The Sopranos for all those years, went and did Mad Men. I think you're going to see a lot of people coming from these Game of Thrones shows or these Walking Dead shows with their own specific point of view. And it doesn't really matter that it's genre because it really is just storytelling after all. So I don't, I don't think we're even uh, kind of scratching the surface of overkill because it really is about the specific writer's voice and how well you execute the show. To me, it's exciting because doing what I do for a living all day is just trying to pick the best writers. And I love that most of the best writers are writing genre right now because that gives me and my team more to choose from. Yeah, is there such a thing as too much sci-fi when it's good sci-fi? No, not for me. No, I think that's the key to it. It has to be good. I mean, I think there's a lot of shows on TV that you, know, you refer to as sci-fi light that you know are in denial that they're even sci-fi fantasy shows. And I think you know we do understand this audience and the genre. And I think Bill in particular does. And I think that's what we want to do is to, is to create smart sci-fi that is different to what everybody else is doing, and not the sort of the Me Too stuff that inevitably you see on TV here. So I think the next couple of years there will be that explosion of genre stuff. I think a lot of network shows will fail. I think people will, you know, move on to the next big thing, and then and then we'll still be in that space, and others will have, have, have exited it. But I think there's a whole new audience, a whole new generation growing up with sci-fi fantasy in a way that you know we've never seen before. I mean, the big book franchises, you know, Twilight and Hunger Games and Divergent, etc. You know, this audience, this this generation wants storytelling which is different, that is explores an alternate reality. That, it, that takes them to places that they can't go in their ordinary mundane lives. And I think that's what's driving it in movies and, and, and video games and TV, and I think that's going to continue. Good morning. Um, I'm Lindsay from Verizon Pius. Uh, I wanted to know what the most interesting insight that you have gathered from your audience research and um, data collecting over the last year and the evolution of sci-fi has been that has kind of tapped into those little nuggets that makes the content so compelling. Our research guy is right behind you. He is. He's <laughs> 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 <It's laughs> just uh, diagonal right behind you. Kind of intelligence as I like to refer to him. I don't know that there's I don't know that there's one specific piece I can call out other than you know the research speaks to the passion for the genre as well. One encouraging thing for me, it, it, it's not deep dive research like Ted does every day, but um, the commitment this past summer to, to defiance and dominion, the consistency on the L3 and L7 basis was a very encouraging sign as we get into more serialized shows. Just the level of commitment our fans have uh, on this channel right now was one that popped out at me as being a new guy here. You know, well, I think one of the new things that we've seen, I think we're responding to it, is, and this is very clear and very direct and very specific, uh, people want high quality shows. They're not interested in low production values anymore, Me Too shows. They want smart writing, uh, smart acting, smart directing, that, you know, the biggest possible um, aspiration from a production value perspective. And if you look at the shows that really are the biggest shows on TV, they all have that, whether it's Game of Thrones or <coughs> Dead or True Blood. These are big, expensive, unfortunately, shows. And that's, I think, what audiences are responding to. And that is the demand that we're also going to respond to as we move forward. Yeah, it's hard. Uh, Michael Hemmen, Airlock Alpha. Um, one of the biggest things that's been happening in the last few years is is how people are watching shows now, like with the with the Netflixes and everything else that's out there, where a lot of people are like, what do they call that? The word just slip my head, but we're watching just watch once. Yeah, they're just watching everything at once. And how does that affect what you guys do? Does that help go back towards serialized programming again, like where Battlestar Galactica days you didn't really have binge watching, but now you kind of have that now? Is that 
I mean, does that change your perspective on how you look at different programs, or is that something that's still down the road and doesn't really affect the, uh, you know, the, just the regular distribution model that's out there now? Uh, I, I think it's a positive. We, you know, it, it gets tricky into monetization and all that sort of stuff, all that boring stuff. But just if, if you uh, if you're a creative guy, you, you definitely want your fans to be that committed to the show and to want to sit there all weekend and have that level of engagement. Um, so that's in that positive. And as Dave said, you know, this channel was ahead of its time with Battlestar Galactica. I think if Battlestar Galactica launched today, it would have done that Breaking Bad kind of shut in, in the rating. So to me, it's, it, it's more opportunity for the audience to grab onto it and then for it to ultimately build. And we have ways of, you know, through, through longer data, to, to her point, to look at the level of engagement and commitment socially and, and otherwise that gives you better feedback to how much the people like the shows and what they like about it. So you know, I think it's good. It's true. We're actually going to lean into it, and we have already. I mean, we're going to fuel binge watching as early as we possibly can. So when we launched Helix this year, uh, we double pumped two episodes, and then we simultaneously gave away the third episode as a pre-linear premiere that you can either stream or download on VOD or however you want to watch it, you're going to see more of that, uh, not just from us, but from other networks, because I think with serialized shows, you need to hook people, and those shows, it takes several episodes for you to really get the hang of the characters and the stories, so there's much more of that to come, because we want our audience to be engaged and loyal and obsessed with, with great characters and great stories. I was just wondering, uh, from out here it looked like the aggressive move into this programming came out of, almost out of nowhere, like those light switch being thrown to somebody every day we were getting announcements. <laughs> this many students were doing that. Was there anything in particular that, that triggered, or was it just the environment in general that triggered such an aggressive program? No, I think Bill triggered it. I mean, when Bill arrived, I think, you know, there were a bunch of things, already in development, and a bunch of things which uh, Bill brought in. I think that um, was like the kind of catalyst in terms of really starting that snowball of announcements. But I think there was a commitment to us and from our, you know, our owners to really get behind this space in a whole new big way. And you know, that was a mandate that we responded to very quickly. And I think you are going to continue to see those announcements moving forward. Um, and, and that's exciting to, I think, you and to us. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I think we may be out of questions. So I get to ask the last one. Uh, because, oh wait, here, one more over here. I, I mean, I was kind of curious. How much control do you guys have over what goes on Netflix and, and what doesn't? Well, that, I suppose I have to take that. <laughs> <laughs> I did not take the question. We have, we have a quite a lot of control. I mean, the complexities of the business model, uh, many of you probably don't need to get into it, keeps me awake quite a lot. Um, you know, the challenge with expensive scripted shows is they are expensive and, you know, we don't fully fund them as a network. We pay a license fee, which is usually uh, two-thirds of the production budget. So if it costs three million to make a license fee, potentially could be as high as two million an episode. So, you know, it's, ex it's expensive, but that, you know, that varies. But that, the other, what's called the, the, the deficit or the back end, comes from either international through program sales or through SVOD, subscription VOD, which would be Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime. And you know, that's how you make that shortfall back up. So you have to play, you, know, you have to walk a tightrope in figuring out the, 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 the business model to make sure that you're made whole on some of these uh, shows. So we, we tend to sell to the highest bidder, clearly, because it's in our interest too. Uh, our content is usually owned by a studio that handles all of that distribution, whether it's international sales or whether it's you know, Netflix or Amazon Prime, etc., and they'll sell it to the highest bidder. So uh, we can influence, um, to some extent, where we'd like our show to end up, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter because you can all access it wherever it is. Um, but what we try and do is we try and give people access to as many episodes as we possibly can so that, you know, to that point about binge watching, you can always catch up. So whether it's on VOD or whether it's on Netflix, Amazon, or Hulu, uh, we want people to have 24/7 convenient access to content. Is, is there audience calculation in terms of like rights out choices? 
between the audience who watch these, these Amazon Prime versus Netflix, or is there a lot of cross pollination between the two audiences? Well, I mean, Netflix is by far the biggest player in this space. Uh, Amazon Prime, I think, are catching up, and as many of you will know, the Defiance is on Amazon, and a lot of our other shows are on Amazon. Um, Hulu Plus, I think, is also you know, coming up to speed. And you know, there's a lot going on in this space. You know, you saw the announcements last week around HBO and CBS. Um, you know, the business model is rapidly changing. So, um, you know, as long as you can subscribe freely to any of these outlets to get the shows, it's immaterial to us. You know, where you get them from. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, that is a important and insightful question, insightful answer. I should just say that one more thing, actually. Obviously, what is critical to our business model is the, is the cable side of the business. <laughs> Half of our revenue, I have to say, is the <laughs> Princess for Dave, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Half of our revenue comes from ad sales. The other half comes from uh, affiliate sales, which is the sub fees that you, know, you guys all pay in terms of your cable or telco subscription. So those, you know, that, that revenue is really critical to us. So you know you have to protect the entire business model. So you have to protect the, the cable operator and the streaming providers. And it's a you know it's a tightrope that, that we have to continue to walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, today we have Town of the Living Dead and Z Nation uh, in the house. So I have to ask, what is your preferred zombie killing weapon of choice? <laughs> I have to end on this. It's important to get a zombie question in. Let me go first because. I think it's very tedious picking off zombies one by one. So, so my view is you need a weapon of mass destruction to take out as many as possible. And my, actually my all-time favorite weapon in all of science fiction is the photon torpedo, which I think could cause quite a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. Even though it probably doesn't travel, in, it only travels in a vacuum, but who cares? So just lay a lot of waste. All right, I, I like that. Yeah. Bill? <laughs> You know, it's, it's, it's like Dave said too, but I, anything that allows me to kill them from a distance mm -hmm. and not be up close, I would not stab them in the face with a knife or anything like that. So a machine gun, we were talking about the crazies, the ending of that yeah. movie, the nuclear bomb that was dropped. That's what I would probably do. Yeah. Anywhere where I'm very far away. By comparison, a nuclear bomb is a delicate touch, you know, uh, when looking at the photon right. torpedo. Yeah. So right. you're, you're taking I'm a good in this. In this <laughs> Well, on that silly note, we have a good day ahead of us. Uh, guys, please uh, show your appreciation. And thank you guys for joining us. Dave Howe, Bill McGoldrick, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.